So I want to talk about the sons of William the Conqueror, William the Bastard, um, because their story is really, really interesting. I said before in the Emma one that um, I think the generation directly before and directly after William the Conqueror are, are, are as interesting as the conquest itself. And seeing as the life of William has been done to death in documentaries, I won't do that. And not as many people know all about what happened, the story of his sons. His three warring sons. Um, so I thought I'd do that. I've got my friend with me. Hi. Um, I don't know much about his sons, so I'm going to learn something. Cool. Cool. Uh, so we'll do that. Um, the, um, the books I'm going to use today are mainly, or exclusively, going to quote from uh, Charles O'Man, who was a professor of history at All Souls College, Oxford, writing in like 1902. Going to use Churchill. History of the English-speaking peoples, writing in the 50s, I believe. And a modern book uh, by a, Nicholas, a guy called, a historian called Nicholas Vincent, which is modern, um, not that old at all, just a few years old. And so we'll see how like, sort of different times deal with the same material a little differently. Like go over the same accounts and see how they deal with it slightly differently and stuff like that. All right then, so um, I'll start with a quote from Professor Oman. Quote, the 80 years which followed the death of William the Conqueror were spent in the solution of the problem which he had left behind him. William had brought over to England two principles of conflicting tendency. The one that of strong monarchical government, where everything depends on the king. The other that of feudal anarchy. He himself had been able to control the turbulent horde of military adventurers among whom he had distributed the lands of England. But would his sons be equally successful? End quote. So what happens when a king died, very often in those days, unless there was a really, really clear line of succession, it would be disputed by warlords, basically. And um, in William the Conqueror's case, it wasn't any different. He didn't leave a clear successor. He had four sons, actually, uh, but one died young, um, apparently in a hunting accident. So he doesn't count. I mean, he doesn't come into the story. He died before anything mattered. Then Henry had uh, a daughter, uh, sorry, William had a daughter and three other sons, the eldest Robert, then a William and then a Henry and they all get to play their part on the stage of history. Here's an overview of Winston Churchill writes with his historian's hat on. Quote, the first generation after the Norman conquest formed a period when the victorious army and caste were settling themselves upon the lands they had gained, and forcing Saxon England, where the tie between a man and his lord was mainly personal, into the feudal pattern, where it primarily rested on land holding. Under William the Conqueror, this process had been harsh and thorough. Under his son William, dubbed Rufus the Red, it was not less harsh, but also capricious. Moreover, the accession of the Conqueror's second surviving son to the throne of England did not pass without dispute. William I's decision to divide his English from his Norman lands brought new troubles in its train. The greater barons possessed property on both sides of the Channel. They therefore now owed feudal allegiance to two sovereign lords, and not unnaturally they sought to play one against the other. Both Duke Robert and William II were dissatisfied with the division, and their brotherly tires did not mitigate their covetous desires. During the thirteen years of the reign of William Rufus, the Anglo-Norman realms were vexed by fratricidal strife and successive baronial revolts. The Saxon inhabitants of England, fearful of a relapse into the chaos of pre-conquest days, stood by the king against all rebels. The Feyd, that's like the, ar the army raised by the local levies, uh, obeyed every summons and supported him in the field as it had its father in 1075. Thus he was able finally to bring Cumberland and Westmoreland into the kingdom. The feckless Robert, who had plagued the conqueror so long, eventually departed in a fit of gallantry on the First Crusade, leaving Normandy pawned to Rufus for the loan of 10,000 marks. End quote. So Robert had been a problem for the conqueror. Yeah, so, yeah, I should say, first of all, before William the Conqueror actually dies, his own son, the oldest one, Robert, is known as Robert Curtos, which means sort of uh, short legs or uh, short trousers, or some people have said, I've heard someone say it was a bit more colloquial than that, it might have meant like a shorty pants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it might have been a bit disparaging. Uh, I don't think people would have called that to his face. Um, but anyway, Curtos, I'll, I'll call him Robert or Robert Curtos throughout this. Yeah, he had rebelled against his dad in like 1075. 
unsuccessfully. But then they'd been um, reconciled briefly, but not entirely. So when William the Conqueror actually dies, one of the details I give is that he'd become corpulent. Mm. He was now quite literally a fat bastard. <laughs> uh, so fat. Or well, they said that he was riding his horse and um, it stumbled or something and the pommel rode up into his gut and ruptured something. And uh, that's what actually did for him. Although he was reasonably old, especially for those days. But he was so fat that he didn't fit in his own coffin. Um, so they had to sort of just smush him in there. And um, during the, the actual funeral service... Apparently he split open, he burst or split open, and there was a disgusting smell that that had to rush through the ceremony and and get him in the ground. But from that moment, it's like a race for who can seize control, really. Seize the crown, seize the treasury. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly, the treasury, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And he had died unexpectedly. Well, he was old, but yeah, he wasn't ill. He basically had some sort of accident, it seems. Here's a quote from Nicholas Vincent. William had at least four sons, one of whom died young, killed as we have seen in a hunting accident, widely interpreted as God's punishment for Norman pride. The eldest of the sons, Robert, known as Curtos, short legs or short stockings, had been promised the succession to the Duchy of Normandy from at least 1063, aged only 13. With his father refusing to relinquish control over Normandy's affairs, Robert increasingly considered himself cheated of his rightful position and authority. In 1078 he rebelled, so Alderic Vitalis tells us, as a result of a family quarrel in which his younger brothers, William Rufus and Henry, played a dice in a room above Robert's lodgings, jokingly urinated on Robert and his attendants. Henry was only 10 years old at the time, Rufus 18. Like many absurd family quarrels, this one had serious consequences. In the ensuing family war, Robert personally wounded his father in, in a skirmish fought outside Gerbroy to the northwest of Beauvais. William was only saved through the intervention of an Englishman, Toki of Wallingford. Although relations between William and Robert were thereafter patched up, tensions between father and son were widely reported by contemporaries and never entirely resolved. After 1084, Robert again broke with his family and spent the next three years, through to his father's death in 1087, as an exile from Normandy. Such dissension was only increased in 1082 when William arrested and imprisoned his half-brother, Bishop Odo of Bayeux. End quote. So the family, even before William dies, is totally fractious. And Robert, before the invasion of England, Robert had already expected to become Duke of Normandy, Mm -hmm. who would have been an independent duke, but for the conquering of England. And then he would have been Duke of Normandy, but under the King of England, right? Well, the Duke of Normandy owed fealty to the King of France. Yeah, and de jure was part of France, right? uh, Well, not really, no. Thanks to it having been taken by Normans, it wasn't. Mm. Right. And well, it's complicated and not clear, and that's part of the problem. Does if you owned lands in Normandy and England, do you owe fealty first to the Duke of Normandy or to the King of England? Or well, de facto to England, right? Well, if you say so. If the King of England owns Normandy, it would be his and for France to try and take back if they could, and they would have the right. Well, well it's, it's difficult. It's complicated. <laughs> I'm and, going by uh, a simple uh, distinction of de jure and de facto. Yeah. <laughs> because the reality is who's actually strongest, like, on, in the field of battle. <laughs> de facto. <laughs> yeah. A- again from Vincent, quote, On his deathbed, this is William the Conqueror, On his deathbed, he failed to make any definite provision for the succession. As a result, there was yet another succession crisis the first of many still to come. Between 1066 and 1216, a period of 150 years, no king of England came to the throne as the firstborn son of his predecessor, and not until 1272 did the succession of a firstborn son occur in peacetime, and apparently without dispute. End quote. So yeah, basically what happens is, William Rufus, the second son, William the Red, is just reacts quicker. Robert Curtoz, the eldest son, if you like the rightful king, I suppose, the man who would be king, um, is just away somewhere else in France or Flanders or Maine or somewhere else in France and isn't there, isn't joining on the spot. So Rufus just goes straight over to England and just sort of takes, just takes it. Robert was away, what, in the Holy Land? No, no, not yet, no. He was just away at another place in France. He was sort of in the process of raising men to continue his struggle against his own dad. And 
for the Normans, was primogeniture the norm, or becoming yeah. the norm? Like? Yeah, it wasn't 100% set in stone as it became. There was more sort of a Frankish tradition where you would maybe uh, split your kingdom up amongst your sons if you had okay. many. It wasn't 100% set in stone that everything goes to the first boy, which it became in later times. And yeah. of course, there's no one particularly to force them to do it. Mm. I mean, here's something about what you're saying about the nature of sort of fealty and stuff. From Nicholas Vincent, once again, quote, The deeds of the kings and queens of Norman England can be briefly told. In many ways, they are less significant than the background of conquest and colonisation against which they were played out. They carry us via the last 20 years of William the Conqueror, through the reigns of his sons, Robert in Normandy and William Rufus in England, to the death of Henry I, the last of these sons, in 1135, and the, the ascension of a grandson of the Conqueror, Stephen of Blois, in circumstances that lead to civil war and the, and the division of England into a series of hostile camps. Obviously we won't be talking about that in, in this, that's another story. The Civil War of the 1130s and 40s was resolved only in 1154, nearly a century after Hastings, with the accession to the throne of a new dynasty, the Plantagenets, formerly Counts of Anjou and hereditary archenemies of the Dukes of Normandy. In turn, the Plantagenet succession, as we shall see, far from resolving the problems of the first century of Norman rule, merely posed further problems of its own. End quote. Because then it, the King of England and, well, he's talking about Henry the Second would be the King of England, the Duke of Normandy, the Count of Anjou, and loads of other things like Lord of Chalois or whatever, much, much richer and more powerful than the King of France, and yet nominally owes the King of France fealty, as at least Duke of Normandy, Dukes of Anjou, yet he's far richer and more powerful. Well, obviously, as a king, you wouldn't have to pledge, you wouldn't, I mean, yeah, you might ask. You're supposed to, yeah. But you're also the King of England. Mm. Well, that becomes like, you know, like in, I'm jumping ahead and getting off of our story, but like King John, for example, the King of France said, look, you might be King of England, but as Duke of Normandy, <laughs> I'm, I'm asking you to like kiss my ring or whatever. Wow. <laughs> and not that, but, um, you know, ask you to bend the knee. Um, and John said, get fucked. And the king said, right, you forfeited all of Normandy or all your French lands. Cheers. Ah. So... Um, Oh, so maybe that was just a pretext. Well, but the thing is, it is not entirely clear who mm. who owes who, who's the more senior partner in all these things. Maybe um, there was just no way of settling disputes like that without fighting hmm. or mm. some seizure. Mm. Again from Vincent, quote, Fundamental to all this were questions raised and never properly resolved by the conquest after 1066, how were the descendants of William the Conqueror to legitimise their rule and succession when their title to the throne had come to them only through bloodshed and main force? How were such kings to resolve the lopsided realities of a dominion or empire divided by the Channel, ruled by Normans yet powered by Engl England's wealth? Our knowledge of events is sketchier than we might wish. Only for William the Conqueror and King Stephen do we have contemporary lives. And compared with modern day ideas of biography, both of these leave a great deal to be desired. The Gesta Guilelmi, or Deeds of William by William of Poitiers, was written to sanitise William's part in the violent overthrow of Anglo-Saxon England. In its present state, it breaks off incomplete shortly after William's accession. The Gesta Stefani, describing the deeds of King Stephen, was written to demonstrate the king's recovery after the disasters of the early years of his reign. The fact that Stephen, far from recovering his reputation, then went on to even more ignominious failure, perhaps explains why the author seems thereafter to have abandoned all interest in the king's cause. End quote. So I talked a bit about Stephen, which again, I'm not going to go into in this story. But So yeah, one thing I'll quickly say before we go on, that we know even less really about the reigns of William the Conqueror's sons than we know about William the Conqueror. So the conquest sort of comes out of the darkness of the, dark, of the relative dark ages um, and then goes a bit darker again afterwards. Uh, I mean, the main accounts are sort of William of Poitiers, William of Malmesbury, I mentioned Aldrich Vitalis. There's a guy, uh, Henry of Huntingdon. Um, they're sort of the main main ones. And we've got a few, lot, like we say, we've got the lives and things. And, and there are people that write a few hundred years after as well. I mean, Aldrich Vitalis is writing after, but William of Poitiers is contemporary. So we, there are sources, but there's not a load of them. <laughs> not as much as we would like, as he says. Yeah. 
Well, you'd always want more, I think. The torch of history was flickering a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's a quote from uh, Charles Eyman, again, writing in um, the very, very late 19th century, turn of the 20th century. Um, so his language is... I like that sort of thing, but it is slightly old-fashioned language. He writes, quote, William, that's William the Conqueror. William had left behind him three sons. To Robert the Eldest, the rebel of 1079, he had bequeathed not the English crown, but his own ancient heritage of Normandy. William the Red, the second son, who had always been his father's loyal helper, was to be king of England. Henry, the youngest son, was left only a legacy of £5,000. The conqueror would not parcel out his dominions any further, but said that his latest born was too capable a man not to make his own way in the world. End quote. So I like that. And of course, £5,000. <laughs> a mere £5,000. Is, is well, a king's ransom, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a shitload of money. You could do a lot with that. Well, you could maybe go and conquer somewhere for himself, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, exactly. You, yeah, you can buy an army with that and and uh, okay. run a mock. <laughs> <Or> campaigning. <laughs> uh, Oman continues... Quote, William the Red hurried over to England the moment that the breath was out of his father's body and was duly crowned by Lanfranc, the Archbishop. But it was no easy heritage that he took up. The Conqueror's death was the instant signal of the outbreak of feudal anarchy. All the more turbulent of the Norman barons and bishops, headed by Odo of Bayeux, had just been released from prison, took arms, garrisoned their castles and began to harass their neighbours. They made it their pretext that Duke Robert as the eldest son, ought to succeed his father in all his dominions. But their true reason for espousing his cause was that Robert was known to be a weak and shiftless personage, under whose rule every great man would be able to do whatever he might please. End quote. They always call Ro- this Robert Curtos, the oldest boy, shiftless. They always call him uh, feckless. Uh, in- yeah, dissolute. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like indolent. Um, just, just weak. It's funny because some of the things he does in his life aren't that at all. Uh, and then other times, yeah, it seems to be exactly that. So, um, but he's an interesting character. I find him really interesting. Or they're all interesting people. Uh, but he particularly, because he's always got this accusation of being shiftless. <laughs> and that he's quite often able to get backing, like baronial backing. Because they, like I just said there, they always think, oh, if he was the big boss, mm. we'll have a free reign. But yeah, he's always sort of doomed to failure a bit. Of course, anyone who knows their English history, there is no King Robert of England. There's no, <laughs> so. <laughs> and what, so in that, he wasn't like the Conqueror. The Conqueror was quite industrious by the sounds of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or um, well, the picture we have of William the Conqueror, whether it's correct or not, is that, yeah, he was just endlessly industrious and, um, yeah, laser-like focus uh, and ruthless as all get out. I mean, it's a ruthless time. Everyone's ruthless, as far as we're concerned. But there's, and then there's a next level, though, you know. But those who grew up in luxury would sometimes become lazy. Mm. Dissolute. <laughs> Oman goes on, quote, In order to defeat this rising, William the Red took the bold step of throwing himself upon the loyalty of the native English. He summoned out the militia of the shires, proclaiming that every man who did not follow his king to the field should be held nithing, a worthless coward, and promising that he would lighten his father's heavy yoke and rule with a gentle and merciful hand. The Feyard turned out in unexpected strength and loyalty, and with its aid William put down all the Norman rebels and drove them out of the realm. Duke Robert, who had prepared to come to their aid, was too late, and he had to return to his duchy, foiled and shamed. So he then reoccupied Normandy? Yeah, for a while, briefly, yeah. And Henry, for now, was just... Just a, a guy. Yeah, no, Henry is totally loyal to his second brother, ah. William Rufus. Okay. He basically is entirely loyal. But yeah, he's not important to the story in and of, in and of himself yet. Um, he's still young, um, you know, a lot younger than his older brothers. So on, the, on sort of the character, if you like, of uh, William Rufus, he's possibly the most colourful of them all. He seems to be pretty badass like his dad you know will will mutilate people and just kill loads of people if he has to but he also was um fairly godless which is really rare in those those days sort of openly um well and maybe homosexual and he was a a practicing homosexualist 
Yeah. Uh, no, he was. No, no he was. Um, <laughs> uh, he never had any children. It seems that he may have been the type of homosexual that is sort of unwilling to ever touch a woman. Um, okay. I mean, for example, Edward II, much hundreds of years after this, is sort of famously gay, but he is able to also sleep with his wife and have children have child, yeah. uh, but but it seems this William Rufus wasn't interested in any of that and and the older historians are really tactful about how they put it but um, uh, Charles Oman writes this about William Rufus William the second William the red quote William's promise that he would be a good and easy lord to his subjects was not kept for long the new king was in all things an evil copy of his father and that's saying something <laughs> Um, he had William's courage and ability, but none of his better moral qualities. He had no sense of justice and was not restrained by any religious scruples. He was, indeed, an open atheist and scoffed at all forms of religion, scornfully observing that he would become a Jew if it was to be made worth his while. Moreover, his private life was infamous, and no man who cared for honour or purity would abide at his court. <laughs> that, like, that's about as close as you'll get an early 20th century historian to say hmm. that he's gay. <laughs> or it implies, like, debauchery in general. Maybe. Yeah. He goes on. Nevertheless, his government was far more tolerable than the anarchy of, of baronial rule would have been. If he sheared his subjects close himself, he took care that no one else should molest them. And one bad master is always better than many. Under him, England was cruelly taxed, and many isolated acts of oppression were committed. But he put down civil war, overcame his foreign enemies, and ruled victoriously for all his days. End quote. Again, from Vincent, it says, quote, Amongst the early Norman kings of England, one alone stands out as a figure for whom religion meant less than it did for most. William Rufus was not only branded a sensualist and sodomite by his opponents, but reported openly to have mocked the church. Warned that he should not cross the channel in the middle of a storm, he replied that he had never heard of a king being lost in a shipwreck, joking that the sea and the winds would obey his royal commands. When told that a group of 50 Englishmen had been acquitted of forest offences by the ordeal of hot iron, in effect a way of testing God's judgment by making the accused hold a red-hot piece of metal and then estimating his innocence or guilt from the severity of the burns, Rufus declared that anyone who believed God to be a just judge deserved to be damned. End quote. So in thinking that he could control the waves, he was like the opposite of Canute. No, no, it was the same as Canute. He was joking. He was... Uh, right, he he so didn't believe in God. He was like, I can control... Yeah, he was taking the piss. It's being ironic. Obviously, he didn't really think that he could do it. But I mean, no. Canute said that Canute actually went out to prove that he couldn't. Right. <laughs> now, I think this uh, anecdote is much more sort of silly <laughs> than that, <laughs> if you like. So it's a mixed bag. He seems he's much more like William the Conqueror. Um, it's just another William the Conqueror. You know, if you kill a, a, a king's deer, you're going to get your hands cut off or probably killed, actually. You know, like the the famous forest laws. He enforced them just as strictly, possibly more strictly, than William the Conqueror himself. And he applied so he was, to most of the forests of the whole country, right? The whole realm. Uh, well, different forests had different laws, Stages. but like the New Forest, for example, which is a massive swathe right in the middle of England, like Hampshire way, uh, much bigger then, I think, than, than now. Well, obviously much bigger then than now. Yeah, that had lots of laws connected to it. And so here's how... Uh, Nicholas Vincent talks about William Rufus's sort of character, if you like. Quote, From the events of 1087, the conqueror's second son, William, known as Rufus the Red, emerged with the greatest of the spoils. Crossing immediately to England and with the assistance of Archbishop Lanfranc, Rufus seized the treasury at Winchester and had himself crowned in Westminster Abbey. Robert Curtos, still in disgrace and therefore absent from his father's deathbed, found himself deprived of the larger part of his potential inheritance. The outcome was warfare between Robert as Duke of Normandy and Rufus as King of England. The vastly superior financial resources of England enabled Rufus to root Robert out of Normandy, at first under threat of military conquest, thereafter by the liberal disbursement of cash. After 1096, and in return for a massive payment of 10,000 marks, Rufus bought out Robert's claim in Normandy. Robert himself used the money, itself an indication of the vast superiority of 
English over Norman wealth, to raise an army for the First Crusade. In theory, his arrangement with Rufus was set to last for three years. In practice, it was not expected that Robert would return from the East. As both parties were aware, Robert's grandfather, the father of William the Conqueror, had embarked for Jerusalem in the 1030s and had never come back. In Robert's case, however, not only did the First Crusade lend him enormous prestige, but returning via the Norman colony in southern Italy, it brought him a wife. The wife, in turn, brought him a son and heir, and a very considerable dowry, with which, once again, to finance war against his brothers. End quote. So, basically, Rufus pays his own brother 10,000 marks. I'm not really sure what that sort of money meant or would have looked like it's obviously a huge amount a silly amount really but um and yeah and Curto sort of goes off on the first crusade and uh doesn't die <laughs> and doesn't stay out there but of course this first crusade is a massive thing isn't it it's a whole thing <laughs> it's not just um a pilgrimage to Jerusalem it's actually movement across Christmas <laughs> an attempt to uh yeah, push the the Seljuk Turks out of <laughs> the Near East. Um, you know, nothing nothing like it had ever happened before. Put it that way. And there's already a tradition of people going on pilgrimage, maybe even an armed pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but not you know full armies to take it and make it a Christian kingdom again and keep it. Yeah, yeah. Nicholas Vincent again says about the so-called Norman myth. Says this quote. As so often in human history, the apparent pride and arrogance of an imperial people masked deep-rooted anxiety as to the justification for empire. Superficially, after 1066, the Normans seemed to be riding higher, not just in England, but in southern Italy, and from the 1090s in the Holy Land and Jerusalem itself. They carved out a swathe across Christendom that their rivals and contemporaries regarded as little short of incredible. Like the Huns of the 5th century or the armies of Charlemagne in the 8th, the Normans seem to have erupted into human history fully formed and invincible. End quote. I'll uh, switch over to Churchill here because he's good on this bit. I like this bit. It's quite long. So on that note, Sir Winston Churchill writes, quote, The crusading spirit had for some time stirred the minds of men all over Western Europe. The Christian kingdoms of Spain had led the way with their holy wars against the Arabs. Now, towards the end of the 11th century, a new enemy of Christendom appeared, 1,500 miles to the east. The Seljuk Turks were pressing hard upon the Byzantine Empire in Asia Minor and harassing devout pilgrims from Europe through Syria to the Holy Land. The Byzantine Emperor appealed to the West for help, and in 1095, Pope Urban II, who had long dreamt of recovering Jerusalem for Christendom, called on the chivalry of Europe to take the cross. The response was immediate, overwhelming, and at first disastrous. An itinerant monk named Peter the Hermit took up the cry to arms. So powerful was his preaching that in 1096, an enthusiastic but undisciplined train of 20,000 men, most of them peasants unskilled in war, set off from Cologne for the east under his leadership. Few of them ever reached the Holy Land. After marching through Hungary and the Balkans, the majority perished by Turkish arrows amid the mountains of Asia Minor. The so-called People's Crusade thus collapsed, but by now the magnates of Europe had rallied to the cause. Four armies, each numbering perhaps 10,000 men, and led by some of the greatest nobles of the age, among them Geoffrey de Bouillon, converged on Constantinople from France, Germany, Italy and the Low Countries. The Byzantine Emperor was embarrassed. He had hoped for manageable mercenaries as reinforcements from the west. Instead, he found camped around his capital four powerful and ambitious hosts. The march of the Crusaders through his dominions into the Turkish-held lands was marred by intrigue and by grievous disputes. Some massacres, actually. Um, <laughs> but, but there was hard fighting too. A way was hacked through Asia Minor and Antioch, once a great bastion of the Christian faith which the Turks had taken, was besieged and recaptured in 1098. The Crusaders were cheered and succoured by the arrival off the Syrian coast of a fleet manned by an Englishman and commanded by an English prince, Edgar the Aetherling, great nephew of Edward the Confessor. Thus, by a strange turn of fortune, the, dis the displaced heir of the Saxon royal line joined hands with Robert of Normandy, the displaced heir of William the Conqueror. 
Aided by divisions among the Turkish princes and by jealousy between the Turks and the sultans of Egypt, the Crusaders pressed forward. On the 7th of June 1099, they reached their long-sought goal and encamped about Jerusalem, then in Egyptian hands. On July the 14th, the city fell to the assault. Godfrey of Bouillon, refusing to wear a crown in Christ's holy city, was acclaimed ruler with the title of Defender of the Holy Sepulchre. Victory was made secure by the defeat at the Battle of Ascalon of a relieving army from Egypt. Many of the principal crusaders thereupon went home, but for nearly a century a mixed international body of knights, all commonly called Franks, ruled over a string of Christian principalities in Palestine and along the coast of Syria. Western Christendom, so long the victim of invaders, had at last struck back and won its first great footing in the Eastern world. End quote. So that paints a good picture. Churchill's good at painting a good picture. And, of course, Kurtos is there, right with him, getting stuck in, I believe. Um, and I think he's sort of asked, or he could have, if he really wanted, I suppose, sort of carved out a, a, a principality or a kingdom or, or, or something for himself. But he decides not to do that. And as I said in an earlier quote, just comes back, gets a wife, <laughs> and goes back to sort of the theatre of, of Normandy and England. And... Um, things all kick off again basically and he's obviously a more prestigious figure for having done that oh massively yeah 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 something i should explain if you go on crusade and come back you're just immediately thought of as something pretty special in sort of Mm. northwestern europe it's yeah you it's like um you've ever heard accounts of sort of uh, senior officers in world war ii those that fought in World War One just had so much more kudos than those that didn't. And, you know, after World War Two, those that had seen combat in World War Two, you know, throughout the 50s and stuff, uh, were just... It's the same now even, isn't it? If you've seen combat in Afghanistan or Iraq, you're sort of considered something a bit more than someone who hasn't, even if they might have served longer in the army or a bit higher War- rank or something. The World War Two generation got called the greatest generation, <laughs> Even if like, you only served on a hospital ship and never saw a shot fired or something. So, m- meanwhile, um, you know, Rufus is just continuing, William Rufus is continuing being king of England, being uh, a thoroughgoing shit. Uh, and by the time Robert comes back, William's been on the throne for like, what, 15 years or something? Right? Yeah, it's not quite that long, but yeah, 10 years odd, something like that, yeah. Charles O'Man writes this, quote, William the Red's arms were as successful against Wales as against Scotland. Oh, he'd smashed the Scots a bit real quick. Pretty good, actually. Um, William the Red's arms were as successful against Wales as against Scotland. During his reign, the southern half of the land of the Kimru were overrun by Norman barons who won for themselves new lordships beyond the Wire and the Severn and did homage for them to the king. Many of these adventurers married into the families of the South Welsh princes and became the inheritors of their local power. In North Wales, the Normans pushed across the Dee and built great castles at Rudlin and Flint and Montgomery, but they could not win the mountainous districts about Snowdon, where the native chiefs still maintained a precarious independence. Beyond the British seas, William waged constant war with his brother Robert and always had the better of his elder, for the Duke, though a brave soldier, was a very incapable ruler and lost by his shiftless negligence of all that he gained by his sword. He was forced in 1091 to cede several of his towns to William and to promise to make him his heir if he should die without male issue. But in 1096 the king gained possession of the whole and not a mere faction of the Norman duchy. For Robert, seized with a sudden access of piety and a spirit of wandering and unrest, vowed to go off to the First Crusade, which was then being preached. In order to get the money to fit out a large army, he unwisely mortgaged the whole of his lands to his grasping brother for the very moderate sum of £6,666. Um, Churchill said it was 10,000 marks, so either way, silly money. So William ruled Normandy for a space, and Robert went off with half the baronage of Western Christendom to deliver the Holy Sepulchre from the Turks and to set up a Christian kingdom in Palestine. Among his companions were the, were the Aethelin Edgar and many Englishmen more. The Duke fought so gallantly against the infidel that the Crusaders offered him the crown of Jerusalem, but he would have none of it and set his face homeward after four years of absence. And that's 1099. 
King William, meanwhile, had been ruling both England and Normandy with a higher hand. He and his favourite minister, Ralph Flambard, I've also heard him called Ranulph Flambard, had been devising all manner of new ways of raising money. When a tenant of the crown died, they would not let his son or heir succeed to his estate till he had paid an extortionate fine to the king. When a bishop or an abbot died, they kept his place empty for months, or even for years, and confiscated all the revenues of the see or abbey during the vacancy. It was on this question that there broke out the celebrated quarrel between William the Red and Archbishop Anselm. Anselm took over from Lanfranc. Lanfranc. Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah, another Italian, incidentally, Anselm. Anselm of Beck. He's famous for other things as well. As a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lanfranc and Anselm of Beck are both sort of known as philosophers. Right. Uh, sort of religious philosophers. Um, yeah. Uh, when Lanfranc, his father's wise counsellor, died in 1089, the king left the Sea of Canterbury unfulfilled for nearly four years <laughs> and embezzled its revenues. But being stricken with illness in 1093, he had a moment of compunction and filled up the archbishopric by appointing Anselm, abbot of Beck. Anselm, like his predecessor, Lanfranc, was a learned and pious Italian monk who had governed his Norman abbey so well that he won the respect of all his neighbours. He was only persuaded with difficulty to accept the position of head of the English church. Will you couple me, a poor weak old sheep, To that fierce young bull, the King of England, he asked when the bishops came to offer him the primacy. But they forced the pastoral staff into his hands and hurried him off to be installed, end quote. Um, So, yeah, later uh, this Anselm, you know, becomes more and more important because we get into a period where there's a question over who's more important, you know, the church, the Pope or or the king. Um, that plays out sort of a bit more famously with Henry II and Thomas Beckett uh, a couple hundred years later. But it's already starting to play out now with this. Of Ranulf Flambert, um, William Rufus's sort of main henchman, Nicholas uh, Vincent describes him as, quote, a sinner of such notorious lasciviousness, end quote, that... Uh, to continue, that that if there were any women around or daughters, you had to lock them up <laughs> so that he wouldn't get anywhere near them. I, I think that's funny. A notorious lasciviousness. I was wondering what the the, the name flambeur means. Is that something to do with flame? Do not know. Oh yeah, the torchbearer. Ah. Sorry, yeah, it's Rana Flambeur, the torchbearer, Bishop of Durham. Briefly, Bishop of Durham. And he was. He was uh... deposed once. Uh, Henry got in. He was a lech. <laughs> it more, sounds like, yeah, more than, than, than rapist, that. Maybe. Serial rapist. Yeah. And, like, tyrant. Like, killer. And bully of all kinds. I yeah, think. yeah. Yeah, a terrible person, it seems like. And he was a servant of William Rufus. Yeah, his, his main henchman, yeah. Oman continues, quote, When William recovered from his sickness, he began to ask large sums of money from Anselm in return for the piece of preferment that he had received. The king called this exacting his feudal dues, but the archbishop called it simony, the ancient crime of Simon Magus, who offered gold to the apostles to buy spiritual privileges. He sent £500, but when the king asked for more, utterly refused to comply. From this time forth, there was constant strife between William and Anselm, the first beginning of that intermittent war between the crown and the church, which was to last for more than two centuries. The archbishop was always withstanding the king. When two popes disputed the tiara at Rome, William refused to acknowledge either, but Anselm would not allow that there was any doubt, did homage to Urban, and thus forced the king's hand by committing England to one side in the dispute. End quote. So that is taking the piss a bit. If I was the king, trying not to impose sort of modern thoughts on it, you would think, like, come on, mate. Like, <laughs> I gave you your title. As the king, it was, like, in my power to give it to whoever I wanted, and I picked you. Why are you, why are you taking the piss? Foreshadowing Beckett again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But William Rufus comes to a bit of a sticky end, though. Well, I'll, I'll let Omen tell it first, and then I'll read what Churchill writes. Um, so, uh, Professor Omen writes, quote, The end of the Red King was sudden and tragic. 
He was hunting in the New Forest, the great tract in Hampshire which his father had cleared of its inhabitants and turned into one vast deer park. And he had chanced to, to draw apart from his fellows, save Walter Tyrrell, one of his chief favourites. A great heart came bounding between them. The king loosed an arrow at it and missed. Shoot, Walter, shoot in the devil's name, he cried. Tyrrell shot in haste, but missed the stag and pierced his master to the heart. Leaving William dead on the ground, he galloped off to the shore and took ship for the continent. William's corpse lay lost in the wood till a charcoal burner came upon it next day and bore it in his cart to Winchester. Such was the strange funeral procession of the Lord of England and Normandy. William's death grieved none save his favourites and boon companions, for his manner of living was hateful to all good men, and his taxes and extortions had turned from him the hearts of all his subjects. End quote. So that's assumed to be an accident? Well, that's one of the things. Um, yeah, it seems. Yeah, all this, all, everything I've read or seen or listened to, say it was probably an accident. But you don't know. I mean, it sounds like he was a tyrant. Um, but what would that Walter Tyrrell personally have to gain? It doesn't seem like he did. Um, we well, you know that old thing. Was it Khrushchev who said, "Look who gains when well, when JFK was assassinated." Yeah. I mean, if you do that, it's his younger brother, Henry, who becomes king. Um, so he gains. But there's no real question, I don't think, that he ordered it or was behind it or anything. Um, I'll read Churchill's account because it's slightly different. Um, Churchill writes, quote, At home, Rufus's extortions and violent methods had provoked the baronage throughout his reign. In August 1100, he was mysteriously shot through the head by, by an arrow while hunting in the New Forest. See, one says it was through the heart and he says it's through the head. Leaving a memory of shameless exactions and infamous morals, <laughs> but also a submissive realm to his successor. The main progress in his reign was financial, but the new feudal monarchy was also more firmly established, and in territory its sway was wider than at Rufus's accession. The Norman lords whom the conqueror had settled upon the Welsh marches had fastened a lasting grip upon southern Wales. The northern counties had been finally brought under Norman control and a military frontier drawn against the Scots. While the rough hands of Rufus chafed and bruised the feudal relationship, they had also enforced the rights of a feudal king. End quote. So, I mean, that's what Churchill writes about it, but... <laughs> it sounds like he might have read Omar as well. You think so, yeah. In fact, because there's so little sort of primary stuff on this, I haven't read all the primary stuff on this, I wish I had, um, uh, but I haven't. They, yeah, they all copy each other, like, pretty badly as well. In fact, I mean, you can see there's whole bits that are just the same. Mm. Nicholas Vincent, on the same thing, uh, writes this, quote, Henry, youngest of these brothers, and the only one of the conqueror's sons conceived after 1066, and hence born in the purple as the son of a ruling king of England, had meanwhile outmanoeuvred Robert. In October 1100, hunting in the New Forest, William Rufus was accidentally shot through the heart by an arrow fired by one of his fellow huntsmen. Quite who fired the shot was never resolved, although most people blamed Walter Tyrrell, Lord of Poix, near Amiens. Attempts to expose a conspiracy have enjoyed little support. Henry, Rufus's younger brother, was an unpleasant, ambitious and libidinous young man, but even he is unlikely to have stooped to fratricide. This did not mean that he was not above scheming or making the very best of a God-sent opportunity. Without even waiting for Rufus to be buried, Henry rode pell-mell for Winchester to grab the family treasury, and then to London where he was crowned in Westminster Abbey only three days later. Not as was customary by the Archbishop of Canterbury, but by the relatively junior Bishop of London. His speed here and the fact that he immediately issued a coronation charter promis promising to revoke various of the more serious abuses of Rufus's regime indicate the panic of the moment. There was still no agreed procedure for royal succession, and the victor in any succession dispute was likely to be the person closest to the scene of the late king's death with the fastest horses and the speediest access to the royal treasury. Henry's seizure of the throne of England was a coup d'etat just as dramatic and controversial as Rufus's accession 13 years earlier. Once again, Robert Curteaux was deprived of what he believed to be his right. 
For the next 20 years, a large part of Henry's energy was to be devoted to warfare, first against Curtoz, then following Curtoz's defeat and capture at the Battle of Tancobray in 1106. So it might not be the case that Henry himself wasn't scheming to kill William, but some of the people, maybe including William, was it uh, something Tyrell? Walter Tyrell. Walter Tyrell. Yeah. Maybe him and some of the others yeah, just quite... thought they would gain from Henry being on the throne instead. Yeah, quite possibly. Quite yeah. possibly. Because it be... sounds like they did immediately yeah. in some ways. So here's the thing about the, a period in the Dark Ages or very early medieval period uh, when you don't know, it's, <laughs> it's rife to just speculate. Yeah. I mean, if I had to give my opinion, I would think the death of Rufus was probably not completely accidental if I had to put money on it. Just from my sort of spidey senses of reading history and stuff, it's I a, would just feel like ugh, it, it seems like, unlikely, you know. Yeah, like the, the event itself, like it sounds, it sounds, it seems to me like that's a hard thing to accidentally do. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, Dick Cheney shot a geezer with a shotgun in the forest accidentally, didn't he? Once, do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Well, accidentally, yeah. Uh, um, but, like, but yeah, like, maybe there was just a really clever deer that ran between them. <laughs> Come on in, come on in. And it does, just as he shot. And actually planned it. Continuing on, uh, Professor Oman writes this. Quote, When the throne of England was thus suddenly left vacant, it remained to be seen who would become William's successor. His elder brother, Robert, whom the baronage would have preferred because of his slackness and easy ways, was still far away on his return journey from the crusade. But Henry, his younger brother, was on the spot and knew how to take advantage of the opportunity. Hastily assembling the few members of the great council who were near at hand, he prevailed upon them by bribes or promises to elect him king and was proclaimed at Winchester only three days after William's death and long before the news that the throne was vacant had reached the turbulent barons of the north and west. After his proclamation at Winchester, Henry moved to London and there was crowned. He did his best to win the good opinion of all his subjects by issuing a charter of promises to the nation, wherein he bound himself to abide by, air quotes, the laws of Edward the Confessor. (laughs) That is, the ancient customs of England, and not to ask of any man more than his due share of taxation, agreeing to abandon the arbitrary and illegal fines on succession to heritages which William II had always exacted. He then proceeded to fill up all the abbeys and bishoprics which William had left vacant for his own profit, to recall Anselm from exile and to cast into prison Ranulf Flambert, the chief instrument of his brother's oppression and extortions. End quote. So Anselm was back, but it hadn't been yeah. him who had crowned... Henry. No, and they'd gone with the London, the Bishop of London, yeah. and he now reigned in London. Henry, yeah, yeah, but his elder brother Robert Curtis has come back. He's immediately able to sort of raise um, an an army, or uh, I mean, he's got money from his dowry to raise an army. There's people that want to, like a faction that want to see him succeed anyway. So it just sort of all starts again, pretty much where it left off. And Henry's quite a bit younger than Robert. Yeah, yeah, a lot younger. 20 years, maybe. Yeah, 15, 20 20 odd years, yeah, yeah. Uh, Churchill writes, carrying the story on, quote, Henry was now ready to face Robert whenever he should return. In September 1100, this event occurred. Immediately, the familiar incidents of feudal rebellion were renewed in England, and for the next six years, the king had to fight to make good his title under his father's will. The Great House of Montgomery formed the head of the opposition in England. By a series of persevering sieges, the family's strongholds fell one by one, and Henry at length destroyed their power and annexed their estates to the crown. But the root evil lay in Normandy, and in 1005, having consolidated his position in England, Henry crossed the Channel. In September 1106, the most important battle since Hastings was fought at Tanker Bray. King Henry's victory was complete. Duke Robert was carried to his perpetual prison in England. Normandy acknowledged Henry's authority, and the control of Anglo-Norman policy passed from Rouen to London. The Saxons, who had fought heartily for Henry, regarded this battle as their military revenge for Hastings. By this new comradeship with the crown, as well as by the royal marriage with, with Matilda, they felt themselves relieved from some, at least, of the pangs of being conquered. The shame was gone, the penalties could be endured. 
Through these two far-reaching factors, a certain broad measure of unity was re-established in the island. End quote. So Matilda had married who? Henry. Ah, and she was a Saxon? Yeah, I think so. Or wasn't she from Flanders? Oh, okay. I think she might have been... Or well, maybe she was. Oh, yeah, I think she was a Saxon. I think she must have been. Yeah, no, she was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because their son, their ill-fated son, was, were going to be, like, you know, restoring the sort of House of Wessex to some extent. Right. So Robert had tried to fight the Conqueror, Rufus and Henry and finally lost and ended up permanently in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 there's a bit here from uh, Oman on the marriage of Henry to Matilda. He says, uh, quote, So Henry retained the crown that he had seized and set to work to strengthen his position in the land. He did his best to conciliate the native English by marrying, three months after his accession, a princess of the old royal house of King Alfred. The lady was Edelgith, or Matilda as the Normans renamed her the daughter of Malcolm, the king of Scotland, and of Margaret, the sister of Edgar the Aetheling. So the issue of King Henry and all his descendants who sat on the English throne had the blood of the ancient kings of Wessex in their veins. Some of the Normans mocked at this marriage and at the anxiety which Henry showed to please his native-born subjects and nicknamed him Godric, an English name which sounded uncouth to their own ears. But the king heeded not when he got so solid an advantage from his conduct and the prosperity of his reign justified his wisdom. And then, I won't read it, but Charles Omar goes on to talk about how sort of English and Norman people are sort of fused together. They become Anglo-Norman. And some relations to the Scots as well. Uh, well, no, that Matilda, yeah, was, son or, uh, was the daughter of King Malcolm of the Scots. So that's, that's helpful as well. Yeah, yeah, it would have been would have been however so so henry took a a somewhat sort of pro-english policy yeah definitely in fact i'll just quickly quote this small bit from that next paragraph quote 30 years after henry's death it was remarked by a contemporary writer that no man could say that he was either norman or english so much had the two races become intermingled end quote so all the historians do a bit on that it's like a set piece to talk about that happening that it's a really nearly a, a full generation now since Hastings. And um, apart from a few sort of Norman diehards, it's all getting mixed together, you know, quite quickly. But Henry himself is still, you know, not a nice guy. He's better than, um, it seems that he's less tyrannical than, than William Rufus, but still quite a badass. Uh, Omar writes this, quote, But Henry's character had a bad side. He was at times as ruthlessly cruel as his father. He punished not only rebellion, but theft and offences against the forest laws by death or blinding or mutilation. Once, when he found that the workmen of his mints had conspired together to issue base coins, he struck off the right hand of every moneyer in England. We shall see that he was capable of holding his own brother in close prison for 30 years. He was as grasping and avaricious as his predecessor William, though he was much less arbitrary and harsh in his exactions. His private life, though not a patent scandal like that of the Red King, was open to grave reproach. Above all things, he was selfish. His own advantage was his aim, and if he governed the land wisely and justly, it was mainly because he thought that wisdom and justice were the best policy for himself. End quote. Um, I understand that he wasn't uh, gay, he was just really... um, Well, I said earlier, libidinous. Yeah, yeah, he (laughs) just, uh, he liked the women's. Uh Um, Partying. (laughs) Yeah. Frivolity. It's funny how the older historians couch it in quite nice language. So uh, just to sort of um, finish out the story of Robert Curteau's, um, the oldest one, Vincent writes that Robert, quote, outlived virtually every other member of his family, dying still in captivity at Cardiff Castle in February 1134, aged well over 80. Robert had spent nearly 30 years in prison in relative comfort, writing poetry and learning Welsh, 
the futility of these pursuits signalling the essential lack of ruthlessness which had led to his being passed over as England's king. Twenty months later he was followed to the grave by Henry I, his younger brother, and the last of the conqueror's sons. End quote. So Henry I was king for... Ages, 20... No, 30, 34 odd years, yeah. About 34, 35... No, about 35 years it is, yeah. He came to the crown in... That came to the throne in... 1100. And, right, right, right. and he died in about 1135, I think, so... Just after Robert. Yeah, know? about 20 months after his eldest brother, yeah. Hmm. But, just to go back a little bit before Henry's died, something sort of sad happens. Have you heard of the, the White Ship? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so the story of the White Ship is another sort of set piece uh, in the story of the Kings and Queens of England. It can't be overlooked. It's like an important event. So... King Henry I had a son, so it was all set to uh, take over when he died, and it was, it was all looking good. Hopefully there wouldn't be any sort of succession crisis, but tragedy strikes. Professor Oman writes this about it. But first of all, he was talking briefly about Henry I's daughter, also called Matilda. Quote, The end of her brother had been strange and tragic. He was following his father from Normandy to England when a drunken skipper ran his vessel upon the reef at Chatterville, only five miles from the Norman shore. The prince was hurried by his followers into the only boat that the ship possessed and might have escaped had he not seen that his half-sister, the Countess of Persh, had been left behind. He bade the Ormonds put back, but when they reached the ship, a crowd of panic-stricken passengers sprang down into the boat and swamped it. The prince was drowned, and with him his half-brother Richard, his half-sister, the Countess of Persh, the Earl of Chester, and many of the chief persons of the realm. Only one sailor lad survived to tell the sad tale of the white ship. When the news of the death of his only legitimate son reached the king, he was prostrated by it for many days, and it was said that he was never seen to smile again, though he lived for fifteen years after the disaster. But, if the chronicles speak true, the death of William was more of a loss to his father than to the realm, for they report him to have been a proud and cruel youth, who bid fair to reproduce some of the evil qualities of his uncle, William Rufus. End quote. Churchill recounts the same thing when he writes, quote, What may be judged malignant fortune now intervened? The king had a son, his heir apparent, successor indisputable. On this young man of 17, many hopes and assurances were founded. In the winter of 1120, he was coming back from a visit to France in the royal yacht called the White Ship. Off the coast of Normandy, the vessel struck a rock and all but one were drowned. The prince had indeed been embarked in a boat. He returned to rescue his sister. In this crisis, the principle of equality asserted itself with such violence at the ship's side, so many leaped into the boat that it sank. Two men remained afloat, the ship's butcher and a knight. Where is the prince? asked the knight above the waves. All are drowned, replied the butcher. Then, said the knight, all is lost for England, and drew up his hands. The butcher came safe to shore with the tale. None dared tell it to the king. When at last he heard the tidings, he never smiled again. This was more than the agony of parental grief for an only son. It portended the breakdown of a system and prospect upon the consolidation of which the whole life's work of Henry stood. The spectre of a disputed succession glared again upon England. The forces of anarchy grew, and every noble in his castle balanced his chances upon who would succeed to the crown. End quote. And, of course, ultimately there is that civil war between Matilda and Stephen of, of Blois. King Henry, in the remaining years of his life, tries to sort of make... <laughs> all the powerful magnates and barons under him in England and Normandy sort of swear oaths to sort of have this Matilda be queen. Who was his daughter. Yeah, who was his daughter, yeah. And, of course, there'd never been any proper queens of England yet. So it was a, it was a difficult sell. Churchill continues, quote, There were two claimants, each of whom had a fair share of right. The king had a daughter, Matilda, or Maud, as the English called her. But although there was no Salic law in the Norman Code, this clanking, jangling aristocracy, mailed and spurred, did not take kindly to the idea of a woman's rule. Against her stood the claim of Stephen, son of the conqueror's daughter, Adelia. 
Stephen, Count of Blois, was leader of the Norman barons and possessed great estates in England. After his elder brother had waived his claim, he was the rightful male heir. The feudal system lived entirely through the spirit of sworn allegiance. Throughout Christendom, the accusation of violating an oath was almost mortal. Only great victories could atone and absolve. But here was a dilemma which every man could settle for himself according to his interests and ambitions. Split. Utter, honest, total. King Henry, in the grey clothes of his life, set himself to fill the void with his daughter, Maud, as female king. He spent his remaining years in trying to establish a kind of pragmatic sanction for a family succession which would spare his widespread domains from civil war. At the age of 13, Maud had been married to the Holy Roman Emperor. In 1125, five years after the white ship sank, he died, and at 22 she was a widow and an empress. We have many records for this remarkable princess, of whom it was said, she had the nature of a man in the frame of a woman. Fierce, proud, hard, cynical, living for politics above all other passions, however turbulent, she was fitted to bear her part in any war, and be the mother of one of the greatest English kings. Upon this daughter, after mature consideration, Henry founded all his hopes. On two separate occasions, he called his murmuring barons together and solemnly swore them to stand by Maud. Subsequently, in order to enhance her unifying authority and to protect Normandy from the claims of Anjou after his death, he married her to the Count of Anjou, thus linking the interests of the most powerful state in northern France with the family and natural succession in England. The English mood had never in later ages barred queens, and perhaps queens have served them best. But here at this time was a deep division, and a quarrel in which all parties and all interests could take sides. The gathered political arrays awaited the death of the king. The whole interest of the baronage, supported at this juncture by the balancing weight of the church, was to limit the power of the crown and regain their control of their own districts. Now in a division of the royal authority, they saw their chance. After giving the island 30 years of peace and order, and largely reconciling the Saxon population to Norman rule, Henry I expired on the 1st of December 1135, in the confident hope that his daughter Maud would carry on his work. End quote. So the, the barons were all or almost all Normans, right? Yeah. And here well, was well that's be... the thing, they're, they're sort of Anglo-Normans now, but yeah, they're more Normans, yeah. <laughs> well, they're becoming Anglified, but they would have been probably... Normans, born of Normans, you know. Like yeah. Born of the appointees of the Conqueror. Charles Oman, continuing on, says this, quote, But, trusting his daughter's fate to the future, Henry persevered in his life's work and left his kingdom behind him at his death in 1135 with a full treasury, an obedient baronage and largely extended borders. Not only had he won Normandy, but he had completed the conquest of South Wales and established large colonies of English and Flemings about Pembroke and in the peninsula of Gower. With his three brother-in-laws, who reigned in Scotland one after another, he dwelt on friendly terms. They did him homage, and he left them unmolested. They were wise princes who knew the value of peace, and under them the Scottish kingdom advanced in civilisation and wealth, and grew more and more assimilated to its great southern neighbour. On the 1st of December 1135, King Henry died. Though a selfish and unscrupulous man, he had been a good king, and the troubles which followed his death soon taught the English how much they had owed to his strong and ruthless hand. End quote. So though the, those three kings were all quite successful kings. What, William the Conqueror, William Rufus and Henry? Yeah, yeah in their own ways. Um, they the were never qu- usurped. Or, Well, I mean, William Rufus may have been murdered. Um, he may well have been murdered, but he still ruled pretty strongly for like 13 years. Which isn't too bad of an innings, I mean. <laughs> a lot a lot of kings after a great conqueror like surrender a lot of what, what was bequeathed to them, so mm. he did better than a lot of people. And they were all pretty ruthless and cruel. Mm. Well, in various ways. Yeah. Just to sum it up nicely, Nicholas Vincent writes this, quote, All told then, from the 1070s through to the 1130s, the wealth and energy of the kings of England was devoted principally to warfare and foreign alliances, and specifically to warfare provoked by family quarrels, fought out in Normandy, and dragging in broad coalitions of northern French noblemen from Flanders to Anjou, and from the kings of France to the counts of Alsace. A huge quantity of English silver and human life was expended in a quarrel provoked originally by a couple of teenagers urinating on their elder brother. 
There was a great deal more to the reigns of both Rufus and Henry, the, Henry I, than just this narrative of family squabbling. But not surprisingly, their contemporaries looked to moral law or cosmic explanations to explain the turmoil. Both the Bible and classical antiquity are full of the contentions of sons against fathers, of brothers against brother, and of the moral causes that were believed to explain such sickness within the body politic. To those seeking explanations, the rebellions of Curtos and the fact that the ruling family were increasingly given over to internal squabbling could only be interpreted as proof of the illegitimacy of Norman claims in England, fit punishment for the violent usurpation with which William the Conqueror had despoiled the Anglo-Saxons. In turn, this carries us back to another overwhelming theme in English history after 1066, the guilt that the conquest had inspired. End quote. 